Well, good evening, everyone. It's a blessing to be here with you at McFerrin. I am um, taking note, the water glass is on the right-hand side. And I, I'm making note of that because at Huntingdon, they've trained me. They have two water glasses. The one on the left is for me. The one on the right is for the song leader. And so I'm trusting Marty has not already drank out of this tonight because <laughs> there's only one up here. And so I'm claiming this one is mine tonight. Uh, so I'm, I'm worried now I'm going to go back and drink out of the song leader's cup, and that's just going to be a problem. But I am so glad to be here, and I've been looking forward to this. And this is my first time to actually have the opportunity to preach um, at McFerrin. I've been able to be here and visit a few different times and uh, tell a little bit about the work in Alaska. And the first thing that I need, need to tell you all again is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I know it was mentioned you all have been praying for the service and, and uh, for me for the last um, few months, but I know that you, know, you all have been praying for us for years. Um, we moved to Alaska, my wife and I, Mary, uh, not too long after we were married in um, 2000. And we helped with the work there for a while and then began the new work uh, that became the anchor. And it wasn't too long after we started doing that that you all started supporting us and have done that uh, just faithfully for years. And I can tell you, um, without your support and the support of others, um, that work could not be doing all of that it's been doing. And, and I, just, I just can't thank you enough. And we've so much enjoyed uh, being able to exchange correspondence over the years. And some of you I know, I look out and I see some familiar faces and that's a blessing to me. I've had some uh, long, long-term relationships with some of you, and some of you I've not really met, but I know you know who I am, and you know about our family, you know the work that we've been doing there in Alaska, and it wasn't uh, too long ago that God called us to Tennessee, and that was a huge change, and it is a huge change for us and our family, but God has been doing nothing but showing us that was exactly what he wanted us to do, and I know that work in Alaska, I was talking to one of the members yesterday, and I know they expressed their gratitude. My, my father was here a couple weeks ago and expressed that to you all. They are standing in need of a pastor still, and I ask that you continue to pray for them. Um, that's very much on my heart. They are still on my heart. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my wife and I um, moved to Alaska. We're originally from Indiana. We moved to Alaska in 2000 and was there in Alaska that we had all of our children and that's all that they know is Alaska. So this move down here has been a, a bit a big deal. Um, our youngest daughter is Anna. She's 15 years old. And um, just pray for her, if you would. She was seeking every service, I believe, at our revival this last week. And just very diligently, and our hearts very burdened for her. Uh, my youngest son is Micah. He's 17. He got saved this last week. I think a lot of you heard that. That was such a blessing. Um, to, to see that happen, and uh, he's not one who would get up and speak in public, but he had to, and I just thank God for that. And my oldest son, Josiah, is 19. He also got saved this last week, and so I'm on cloud nine right now. I got to baptize both of them this last Sunday, and that was neat. They're both bigger than I am, and Micah caused a splash that went over a little bit into the choir area here, and, and Josiah, he's like 6'5", and I, I got wet too baptizing him. I was pulling water out of my face, but, but it was a blessing um, to be able to share that moment with them. And our oldest daughter, Grace, uh, today's her 21st birthday, and I think you all um, know she passed away about a year and a half ago, uh, very tragically, and, and, um, and I know that you all have been praying for us through that time, and uh, so today's kind of tender in my heart, and uh, my wife and I were talking back and forth about whether we were going to post something on Facebook or not, and I don't know that we ever figured out whether we were, but my wife made a comment to me. She said, what if we took, well, let me give you a little context. Grace journaled every day, she her Bible study, um, and the morning of her accident, we have her journal. She was studying in Zephaniah, the passage she was reading, her thoughts, she was writing about it, and then she wrote the things she was praying for. And on the prayer, prayer list, among other things, were for Josiah and Micah and Anna to be saved. And we thought about posting that and putting two check marks because God's still answering our prayers. So I'm sorry. It's a, it's a soft day. But, um, but while I'm here, I want to ask you to pray for one more thing. Um, 
my wife is the 14th child in her family. And um, God has worked and saved some of her siblings over the years. She's the baby. It was a, a very strong Catholic family. One of her brothers, uh, Tom, is um, terminally ill with cancer. Doesn't have long, it seems. Um, the treatments don't seem to be making a lot of progress. And um, he's been trying to talk to his siblings, FaceTiming them one at a time. And Mary has been uh, praying for him. And to our knowledge, Tom's not been saved. And uh, she is hoping to be able to FaceTime with him tomorrow and talk to him what could be her last time. And I just would ask you all to pray for Mary and that opportunity she has with her brother. Um, God has done greater things. And so pray for, pray for Tom, if you would, and pray for Mary. The thought on my heart tonight, this passage, the passages I want to share with you, honestly, it was on my heart uh, last week during our revival, and I shared these passages and, and many of these thoughts, and it's very unusual for me to want to share them again, but it just gripped my heart, and I want to share these thoughts with you all tonight. If you want to read along with me, I want to read two passages of Scripture. The first one is in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And this was just part of my Bible reading a couple weeks ago. I've been reading through parts of the Old Testament. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're coming to the very end of Moses' life. He had ministered to the people of Israel for 40 years, poured himself into them, God had done great things through Moses and delivering these people, and he is putting out his last words. And that's really the title of the message tonight, or last words. And as Moses is finishing these things up, it says in Deuteronomy 31, starting in verse 24, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. That Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of God your hands. That's pretty dark. That's pretty negative. I don't know if you all have a positive and encouraging Caleb down here, the radio station, but that's probably not one of the verses of the day that they would play on that radio station. Um, it's not hopeful. It's very fatalistic. And Moses, what he says here, what's interesting, this is not just a bitter old man. You know, at the end of his life, burned out and frustrated. If you were to read the passages prior to this, you would see that Moses is saying exactly what God told him to say. This is a message from God to the people of Israel through Moses. And he was finishing up the writing of this book, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He was finishing this up, putting it in the ark, and he was telling them what was to come. And as I was reading this and I was seeing what Moses was doing and gathering the uh, elders of Israel, it reminded me of another passage. It reminded me of another man of God who gathered together elders to speak to them. And it was the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 20, he gathers together as he's passing through on his third missionary journey. He's headed to Jerusalem. The Lord has told him that bonds await him there, that he's going to be taken captive. He believes this is the last time he will see these Ephesians, and he's just passing by, and he calls the elders of the church to come, and he's going to speak to them. And so in Acts uh, chapter 20, there's a kind of a long address, but I'm going to pick up in verse 25 and read 
Paul's last words to the elders at Ephesus. He says in verse 25, And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away my disciples, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Those were Paul's last words to the elders at Ephesus. And if you were to put those things side by side and look at those and and look at the content, there are a lot of things that are very similar. I want to talk about the similarities for a second. Moses was speaking to God's people. Israel. Israel as a nation at that point in time were known as the people of God. Paul And the New Testament is speaking to God's people. He's speaking to the church there at Ephesus. So both of them are addressing God's people. Both of these men are godly leaders. Both of these men had invested years in these people. Moses had invested 40 years in the Israelites. God preparing him for that 40 years during the first 80 years of his life. Paul spent three years with the Ephesians. You may say, well, that's not very much, but Paul spent more time with them than he spent with anybody else. So they got all that Paul could give them that the Lord would allow him to give them. So Paul had poured himself into those people. Both of these people had God's word poured into them. Moses had written, you know, those first five books and had taught those people. In fact, that's what he was doing. He was finishing it up and he was putting it in the ark so it would be preserved for them. So he had committed to them. The word of God. Paul told these people that he had not failed to to preach to them the full counsel of God and lay it all out there in the time. Both of these men loved these people. I know Moses seems like an old grump in this passage, but Moses is the one who pled with God when God was ready to completely wipe out and destroy that whole nation at the base of Mount Sinai. He pled with God, don't do it. Please save this people. Moses loved these people. He loved these people. Paul loved the people at Ephesus. The Bible, he talks here, he says about how with tears that he had worn them night and day for three years. He had been with those people. He had poured his heart into these people. In both circumstances, these were a final gathering, a final gathering of the elders of the people in both circumstances. Both men spoke under the inspiration of the Lord. Both men gave a prophetic word about the future. Moses told the people of Israel what lied ahead for them. Paul told the church at Ephesus what was ahead for them. That there's going to be grievous wolves come up and there'll even be people arise that'll speak perverse things. Both of them gave a prophetic word about difficult times. And I believe all the hearers, the Israelites who heard Moses and the Ephesians who heard Paul. I don't want to call you guys Israel and call you guys Ephesus. I'm just kind of going back and forth. Okay, so don't get proud or anything. But as 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 Paul is talking to the Ephesians, I'm sure the Ephesians had good intentions. I'm sure all the people who heard those things were thinking, you know, we want to be good. We want to do the right thing. We want to follow after God. We don't want to go that way. But there was a stark difference between these messages. Moses's message was incredibly bleak. It was dark. It was not hopeful. 
There was not, you know, a, a, a sunrise looming on the back of this. He simply said, you are not going to be able to do it. You guys are going to mess up. You have done this while I'm living. You are going to do it after I die. You are not going to be able to follow after God. Whereas Paul's message, even though he prophesied hard times, he ends by saying, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. Why the difference? Why is there a difference? Why was Moses' message such a downer? And why did Paul end with a note of hope? That's something I want you to think about tonight. And, and one of the reasons this, this message I think is so special to me is that it, in a way, it's my testimony. In a way, this is kind of my testimony. And I'll, I'll try to explain that eventually. But the reason I believe that there is such a distinction between these last words of Moses and Paul to these groups of people that they both loved is because they were speaking to people under two different covenants. People under two covenants. Totally different covenants. A covenant is an agreement. It's a compact. When you, if you were to go and take out a loan, you would enter into a debt covenant with some sort of bank or lending institution. You would go in there and you'd say, I need $50,000. I need you know, you to give me this money. And they would say, okay, we'll have this relationship. I'll give you this money. Here are the terms and conditions. You need to sign this that you're going to pay such and such an interest rate. You need to sign this that you're going to agree to pay so often. That you're going to pay on this until it all gets paid off. Here are all the terms and conditions. You both would look at the contract. You would sign this covenant. You'd be making an agreement. Marriage is a covenant relationship. Two people coming together and making an agreement together. Well, these people of Israel had entered into a covenant with God. They were under what we call the old covenant. Covenant, or maybe you recognize it this way, the Old Testament. That's what the word covenant means. The word testament means covenant. It's talking about a people who were under an old covenant. And if you were to say, what is that covenant? What, what was the terms of the agreement? Jesus, I thought, just it was able to handle this very, very succinctly, very clearly. He was speaking to a lawyer in Luke chapter 10. It says a lawyer came and put Jesus to the test and he said to him, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How can I live forever? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? You go to your document, go to your covenant. At that time, he would be looking at the Old Testament. Go to that. You, you tell me what you see there. How do you read it? And he answered, the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, you have answered correctly. That's it. That's it. And then he says this, do this, and you will live. And right there, in a nutshell, Jesus nails it. He nails the old covenant. Do this and live. If you want to know tonight how you can have eternal, everlasting life, here's an answer for you. Love God perfectly, completely, without ever erring in that, with all of your strength, with all of your being. Love God perfectly and love your neighbor, the people around you, the people that God brings into your sphere of influence. Love them just like you love yourself. Do that and you'll live. Do that and you'll live. That, that's it. Right there. There, Jesus says, if you do that, you've got it. And right there in that summary, we see the substance of what? The Ten Commandments. Right? Because where did Israel enter into this covenant? They did it at the bottom of a mountain. There are lots of mountains in Alaska. You all call things mountains here. I'm not quite sure they're the same. But there was a mountain that the people of Israel gathered around, Mount Sinai. 
And it was there at that mountain, God came and spoke to them and said, look, here are the conditions. You can be my people and I will be your God. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. I'll never leave you. Here are the conditions. And the summary you could give, the summary document would be the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments can be broken down exactly like that lawyer did before Jesus. The first four are about loving God. No other gods, no graven image. Remember the Sabbath day? Don't take my name in vain. All of those things are about loving God. And then the rest of them, the bottom six are all about how we are to love one another. Sins that we should not commit against the others. That lawyer looked at the summary of the summary document, the covenant document, the Ten Commandments that Moses was given by God that was supposed to kind of outline this agreement And he said, it's about loving God and loving other people. And Jesus says, that's exactly right. Just do that perfectly and live. Do that and live. And as Israel came together at the base of that covenant and they told God, yes, we'll do this. Yes, we'll follow you. Moses went up on that mountain to get the commandments written in stone by the finger of God. By the finger of God. And while he was up there to get that covenant symbol, the actual tablets of stone, Israel, because they got impatient at the base of that mountain, violated, honestly, if you read it right, several, several of those laws at the bottom of that mountain while they were waiting for Moses to come down with the tablets of stone. That covenant document, that sign of the commitment that they had just entered in with God. If we were to try to understand what that's like, it's like having a wedding ceremony here and a husband and wife, a bride and groom coming forward and and the minister going through the vows and each of them saying, yes, I do. And yes, I do. And between that moment and when the ring is slipped on the finger, the symbol of the covenant, one of them goes off and cheats on the other. That's exactly what happened at the base of Mount Sinai. That is exactly what happened at the base of Mount Sinai. Those people could not keep that covenant even at the moment, at the time when they were given that covenant. And you wonder why Moses said what he said. You wonder why God inspired Moses to say what he said. But Paul was speaking to people that were under a new covenant. A people that were under the terms of a different relationship with God. Same kind of situation. Here's how you can be his people and he can be your God. But the terms of this agreement are different. And when Jesus was speaking to Mary or Martha in John chapter 11, Jesus said to her in John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You see, the terms of the Old Covenant were do and live. The terms of the New Covenant are believe and live. And this covenant was different. It wasn't something entered into at the base of a mountain in that sense. But it was brokered at the hill of Calvary by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the way that you can enter into that new covenant, that new relationship with God is not by doing a bunch of things, but is by realizing that you can't and repenting and turning from that and putting your trust and your faith completely and solely in Jesus Christ. This covenant is sustained and kept not by you doing good works, but it is sustained by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of your own doing, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone would boast. There is no boasting of gaining or sustaining this covenant, this salvation. And what you have in this place is a New Testament church. A new covenant church, if you will. What do you do when someone comes forward to join this church? And I have all confidence because I've seen it online. What do you do? You ask somebody who comes forward to tell you what? 
Their testimony, their testimony of being saved, their testimony of having entered into this new covenant relationship with God where they know God and God knows them, not brokered on the basis of a commitment or a decision or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. But what they come and they express to you is what happened in their heart when they turned from sin and they looked to Jesus and Jesus came and saved their soul and he washed them and they have this new relationship. And upon that rock, upon that relationship, you build a new covenant church. You see, the greatest difference between these covenants is the change in the relationship between that person and God. You see, that was why Moses was so negative. Because the hopes of Israel staying in that covenant was based on Israel being faithful. A faithfulness that they didn't have in them. In fact, even when this was given, the Lord was trying to give them the message of the gospel through Moses. There in Deuteronomy chapter 10, I'm just going to read a few verses here. In Deuteronomy 10, you see this summary in verse 12, and it says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. I mean, this is it. It's it's obedience from the heart to God. I'm going to drop down, therefore, to verse 16. God has called you to this obedience, so therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Stiff neck, meaning stubborn to hear, stubborn to obey, unbroken, unchanged. What I'm calling you to do, you can't do. You can't do this on your own. You don't have the strength to obey. I've put before you this beautiful, wonderful law that's for your good and all these truths and all these commandments that are meant to make you flourish and be blessed. You can't even do it. You need your hearts to be changed. But that's exactly what happens when somebody comes under that new covenant. You get changed. You get changed. Paul wrote elsewhere, he said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things are become new. I have been so joyful the last few days watching my sons. You know, we've prayed for them for so long to be saved and we have raised them imperfectly, but tried to raise them in a Christian home and to be teaching them things and doing family devotions and all the sorts of stuff and trying to pour truth into them and watch them growing up. And they've been in the eyes of the world, very good kids, but they had no capacity to obey from the heart, the things of God. And I've just been watching Because I believe a real salvation will change you. It will change you. It's not just an emotional experience one time. My friend, that's just the beginning of what God is wanting to do in your lives. And I've just been watching them. I've been watching them reading the Bible and and, and some other Christian books and rearranging their schedules to go to church and not miss any services and VBS all of their own volition. We've not said a thing. And, you know, my sons were saying tonight, you know, like, well, we got business meeting tonight at church. Should we not do youth groups so we can be at business meeting? Because we're members of the church now. And I'm like, you guys need to figure that out. But I'm just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, there's a change in them. There is a different heart in them. I watched, I watched my oldest son volunteer to help his sister paint her room. And I know y'all don't know my kids. But I'm going, ain't nothing but Jesus can do that. (laughs) Jesus did that. You know, I see these things going on and I'm seeing a, a new heart that's been given in them. And that's what the Lord was always desiring, what God was always wanting for the people of Israel. And back in the Old Testament times, he spoke through Jeremiah and he looked forward to another covenant, another relationship. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Everybody 
lost and saved. We can read the words of Moses and we can read the words of Paul and we can see messages that are here for every single one of us. It's here. It's just as true for you if you're lost and true for you if you're saved. Difficult days lie ahead. Difficult days lie ahead. There will be challenges and trials. It's called life. Things that we don't expect around the corner that will surprise us, that will knock us on our backs. Things that will be hard. Some will be of short duration. Some will be of long duration. Some will completely, radically alter our lives in ways we don't expect. It rains on the just and the unjust, folks. Every one of us, Satan will seek to attack us and distract us and destroy us. He hates everybody in this house tonight. He hates everyone. He's a liar. He's a murderer. We all are going to face temptations arising from within us because we are all still in this body of death. We all still bear a sin nature in this world. We're all going to be faced that lost, saved alike. And every one of us, if the Lord doesn't come back, we're going to face death. We're going to face death. There will be people that will walk by your casket one day. All of us lost and saved. And every one of us in this place, lost and saved, we may have good intentions tonight. We may have good intentions about the way we want to live our life and the things that we want to see happen. But I can tell you that only those who are under that covenant of grace, the new covenant, have any word of hope for the future. You're the only ones that I can give you words of consolation, of comfort, of promise. Because if you're lost, if you don't know the Lord, if you are still under that covenant of works, that old covenant, I cannot offer you hope or solace for the challenges and trials of life because God's promises are not for you. They're not. I can't promise you all things will work together for good because that promise is only for those who love Him to those who are the called according to His purpose. Not for everybody. I can't offer you armor for Satan's attacks. We can read in Ephesians 6 how Christians, we have armor that we can put on and we can stand against the wiles of the devil. But my friend, if you're lost, not only is he going to attack you, but the Bible tells us that you're unwittingly following him. He is going to use you and throw you away. If you're lost, if you don't have that relationship with God, if you've not been changed, you have no means to overcome sin and temptation. It will overcome you. It will define you. You know, if if you've ever looked at that list, Paul speaks, I think, in 1st or 2nd Corinthians. And he's talking to those, those Christians of that church. And he goes through this list of, you know, adulterers and liars and all these different things. And then he goes, and I love it, he goes, and such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been changed. You see, sin used to define you. It used to be this inescapable trap that you could never find your way out of, but that is no longer the case. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you can overcome through Christ, but I can't give you that hope tonight if you're lost. And there certainly is no hope for you beyond the grave. Only a certain expectation of judgment. You see, my message to you tonight about what lies ahead, if you're lost, I have to be like Moses. I cannot give you any hope, any, any ounce of hope for life for you under that old covenant. All I can do tonight is to urge you to flee, to run to Jesus, to look, to come under that new relationship, that new agreement with God, the repentance and faith, so that you might have everything you need, so that you can be changed. And I told you at the beginning, this is my testimony. This is my testimony. Because I was, I was raised in a very good home. I was in church. My father was a pastor. I was eight years old when I realized I was lost. We were attending Bethel. 
in Indianapolis at the time, and Brother Eugene Brown was the pastor there. And it was actually when uh, Sister Karen's brother Charlie had told of being saved, and he came back that night during revival and hugged me. And that moment right there, at that point in time, I knew things were not right between me and God. And I didn't say a word. I sat there like a rock. But for the first time in my heart, I knew things weren't right. And I lied to myself. I told myself I was okay. I would lie to everybody else. But I eventually had to admit it to myself. And I eventually came out and, and I started seeking the Lord. I was one of those chronic seekers. I would seek every time they give an invitation. The pastor could preach on tithing, give an invitation, I'd be down on the altar. And boy, I got mad when I saw other kids getting saved and I wasn't. I was in high school seeking every chance I could get. And I'd see these other kids and I knew what they were doing on the weekends. Some of them were coming and getting saved. And there I was. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I mean, I was a good kid. And I was one of the good lost people. Because you could count on me to come down and pray. Went off to college in my freshman year. And apart from the protection and the controls of my family... I figured out over the course of that year who I really was. And it scared me to death. And the reason it scared me was because I had been raised to follow God. I had been raised to go to church. I had been raised to do good things. And I wanted to do that but I found that I had no hope of being able to do that myself. And that night that I found the Lord, it was simply I knew that I could not be who I was raised to be if I didn't have Jesus in my heart. Amen. You know, God, it took him a while to get me broken to that place. But he got me to that place where I knew I could not be that. I had no capacity to be that. In fact, I was getting ready to give up and just walk away from God and church completely. I didn't tell everybody that. In fact, I've not, probably not told anybody that, really. But I was ready to just walk. I was ready to leave. I was so frustrated. But that night, in that place, when God showed me that I had all these things that I was trying to be, that I couldn't be that, but only if He would save me, if He would change me, could any of that be possible? That night, in my brokenness, I knew not just that I was going to go to hell. My friend, I had known I was going to go to hell for a long time. But what God showed me that night was that I deserved to go to hell. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference between being afraid of hell and knowing you deserve to be in that place. And that's what God showed me that night. And when I turned to Him and when I looked to Him, and broken and that and that brokenness there and then the simplicity of I don't even know exactly what I said but it was of the essence that if you don't save me it's never going to happen my friend that night there was a peace that I had never known before a peace I had never known before and I know I expected more things than that and went through all sorts of stuff after that and confused about what happened but my friend it was simply a peace of God that burden and that conviction was gone and it was the sweetest peace I had ever known and I thank God for that and I thank God not just for that peace, but I thank Him for a new heart. A new heart that has the capacity through His help to try to be able to be what He's called me to be. Imperfectly. But He gave me a new heart. And my friend, if you're lost tonight, I know that's what you need too. You need a new heart. You need a new heart that is soft to God and soft to the things of God. You need a new heart that can care about what really matters. You need a heart that, that has a desire to obey God. And you don't have that. And you are never going to be good enough and do enough things to earn that or get that change in yourself. You need a new heart from God. And so I want to encourage you tonight, I'll ask Brother Jeremy and Brother Marty, if you want to give an invitation this evening.
But come to Jesus. There is no other way that this can get taken care of. There is no other hope that you can have. But to go to Jesus tonight for 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 the only thing that you need from the only one who can give it to you. There's nobody else here that has what you need. And what you know, need to know, and I hope you know, and I hope God's spirit, if nothing else is imprinting this upon your heart, is to know that you don't have what it takes. But he does. There is nothing more important tonight than having that new heart, that new relationship with God. I urge you tonight to seek him while you have the opportunity.